All right, welcome everyone to the final lecture regarding Theodorsen's unsteady aerodynamic model. In this lecture, we will reconciliate the circulatory force to the non-circulatory force, and we're going to come up with the final solution to Theodorsen's <clears throat> unsteady aerodynamic model. Now, recall that last lecture, we derived the circulatory contribution so that we satisfy the no penetration boundary condition and have Q theta, which is the velocity tangent to the circle in the circle plane, be zero at theta equal to zero to satisfy the cutter condition. So now we need to reconcile source sink, so the source and sink flow with vortex flow. Now recall that for the color condition to be satisfied, we need Q theta at zero for all time to equal zero. And that essentially translates to the following equation. Well, yeah, translates to two over pi from zero to pi of W A sine squared psi over cosine psi minus one D psi plus one over pi B b to infinity of square root of xc plus b over xc minus b. And remember that in this context, xc is the exposition of a vortex wake element in the plate plane, which is different from the earlier context we use xc in, which was a coordinate in the circle plane. Gamma w as a function of xc and t, dxc is equal to zero. Now, as a reminder, this bit here is the non-circulatory q theta at theta equal to zero and t. And this bit here is the circulatory q theta at theta equal to zero and t. So, we need to make sure that these two add up to zero so that the total Q theta we get at the circle plane at theta equal to zero to be zero. All right, so now how do we proceed? Recall that WA in this equation is actually kinematics. So it is prescribed from when kinematics so this quantity is prescribed now gamma w as a function of xc and t is unknown and so far so far only kinematic restriction we have imposed is small amplitude motion. And we use the restriction of small amplitude motion to introduce a perturbation velocity potential field. So now we're going to include additional restriction here to the kinematics that would help us solve the problem. The additional restriction is harmonic motion. And what, does, what do we mean by harmonic motion? We mean that the wing will move in a, some sort of a constant sinusoidal oscillation. 
So in this context, we, wa of x and t can be expressed in a complex form as such wa bar of x multiplied by e i omega t. So we split this sin so this sinusoid of the velocity of the vertical velocity is both a function of x in that every other point on the wing could experience a different velocity depending on its x location. But on top of that, each velocity varies in time like so. So you have a, a uh, vertical velocity that is dependent on the location of the point on the wing and the time snapshot um, the wing is at. So, the, and this is captured by the two, by the, by splitting this function into two components, whereas this component is the spatial and this component is the time component. Now, obviously this is a complex, um, this is a complex function and our velocities are real. We have no imaginary components to the velocity. And thus we can simply find the velocity by taking the real part of the complex function that we come up with. So in a sense, W of A, X and T is the real part of this function. So for instance, okay, if we draw the complex plane here, right? Let's say this is I, I, the imaginary component of the complex function and the real component of the complex function. And we wanna plot just W A bar. Now W A bar can have some complex velocity, but we take the real part to find the actual component of velocity of W A bar. So we neglect that imaginary component because um, we cannot have imaginary velocities in, in reality. So again, just to recap, to get the velocity as a function of both space and time, you plug in the spatial function, some snapshot in time, and then you get the real part of this function. And another note is that EI omega t is a sinusoid. So EI omega t, if you deconstruct it to a, the cosine and sine using Euler's formula, you end up with cosine of omega t plus i sine of omega t. And thus, we're only concerned with the real bits, which is this bit, which is a sinusoid using a cosine. All right, and I hope this uh, sort of makes the point clear. So actual vibrations. represented by real parts. All right, fantastic. So we still need to make some, we need to make use of some more assumptions that we've laid out. The first assumption we said, well, sorry, I mean, another assumption that we mentioned is that we assume that the wake moves with the free stream velocity. So we assume that gamma w of some point in the wake that drifts downstream at velocity u to be constant. 
And what does that mean? Let's say we take a wing at t equal to zero and we have some point, okay, of the wig that's sort of moving at a velocity u because it's moving with the free stream at t equal to delta t, this point would have moved u delta t. It would have moved with the free stream velocity u for delta t time, so the distance traveled is u delta t. Thus, if you probe the vortex strength at this point, you would get gamma w, and since we're probing the vortex strength in a subsequent time snapshot, at that same sort of point, we should also get gamma w. And what does that mean? That means that gamma w of c equal to zero, for example, so we'll take the um, yeah, we'll take some point x equal to zero, and t is equal to gamma w of x equal to u delta t, and I'm gonna just move this somewhere, make this a little neater, x equal to u delta t and t equal to delta t. This function that we just wrote is just a, another way to say what we've been saying in the schematic. Now thus, position of a wake element can be described in the following form. C, as a function of time, is equal to the initial position xc, plus u delta t. Now, xc and u delta t vary because delta t varies. But xc naught is the initial position of that vortex element, which does not vary. So, so we know that Gamma w is constant for this xc. Thus, we can rearrange things. Thus, c w is constant when xc naught, and this is just arranging the equation above, is equal to xc minus ut. So you know that gamma w is constant for xc naught that is constant. Thus, it is constant for this value being constant. And what does that mean? That means that we have essentially reduced, so we have this, we have, sorry, we have gamma w that is dependent on both xc and t, we've been able to reduce its de dependency from two variables to just one variable that is composed of these two variables. So we've simplified the problem quite a bit. And then, that's what we have done is, gamma w is a function of xc and t because it does vary with location and time but we can reduce this function to just gamma w of xc minus ut, right? Because we said that gamma w will be a constant for xc naught. So if you vary xc naught, you're varying the actual vortex element you're looking at. Thus, the vortex strength would vary, but you no longer have the dependence on xc and t independently. They, you have this dependence on both of them still, but now they're lumped into one variable. So it sort of reduces the complexity of the function. And we can also say this is equal to gamma w of t minus c over u, which is just a simple scaling. 
and thus we have reduced the dependency on two variables to one variable. Great, so we'll put a star next to this equation. So we, we now, since we, we have expressed our velocity perturbation in some sort of a complex sinusoidal form, we can do so as well for the, um, the velocity, sorry, the vortex strength of the wake. Thus, the harmonic wake can be expressed as gamma w of xnt is equal to gamma w bar. Again, the same thing we have done with the velocity, vertical velocity perturbation, times ei omega of t minus x over u, which can be rewritten as gamma w of e i times omega t minus k c star, where k is equal to w b over u, and that's the reduced frequency. And C star is C over B, which is wake position, but rather than using absolute um, units, we non-dimensionalize by the semi-chord length, which gives you the wake position in semi-chord. And again, semi-chord is basically just half the chord. So recall that the term for the circulatory lift is minus rho u integral from b to infinity of c over c squared minus b squared square root gamma w of c and t dc. And this is from last lecture. We can come up with a variable q, right? Which we will assign this expression to. And this is essentially to massage the circulatory lift expression for the solution itself. And you'll see what's gonna happen in a bit. C plus B over C minus B, gamma W of C, T, T, X, C. And we can sub Q into LC. Well, not LC, my apologies. We will just sub it into L. And the full expression of L is L equal to L and C plus LC, which is equal to LNC, plus two pi rho u b q, and then times this nasty, nasty expression, v infinity of C over C squared minus B squared, gamma w, C t, d c, c, over b infinity, c plus b over c minus b, gamma w of c and t, d c. And, and all we did is just we took the this expression of the circulatory lift and we multiplied by q and divided by q.
Next step is we sub the assumed solution, which is the harmonic solution, star, which is given here. We sub that into the integral ratio. And what does what would that give you? Give you the following. Gamma W E I Omega T B one to infinity of C star over C star squared minus one and the square root times E minus I K C star T C star over gamma W bar E I omega T times B integral one to infinity of x c star plus one over x c star minus one square root e minus i k x c star d x c. So as you can see, this cancels out with this, and you have this sort of nasty, nasty expression that does have a solution. So. Theodorson was able to figure out that this solution corresponds to a ratio of basal functions, and that ratio gives you the Theodorson function, the C of K. So Theodorson's function is some function that is only dependent on the reduced frequency. And and thus, like solving this integral gives you this function, and we will talk about what this function is in a little bit. But essentially, it comes out to a function. So it is solvable. It comes out to a function that is only a function of the reduced frequency of, obviously, the pitching motion of the wing. So what is CK? CK is a complex valued function that is dependent on the reduced frequency, thus is equal to f of k plus i, imaginary number, g of k. And this is a complex valued function of reduced frequency only. Which is pretty phenomenal. And in more detail, Theodorson identified the complex integrals that we, essentially that sort of ugly ratio, identified the complex integrals as Henkel functions of the second kind. Which means that C of K, which is equal to F of K plus I G of K, that actual function is equal to this following Henkel function of k over h1 2 of k plus i h o of k. And these are very detailed stuff that you don't really need to, like for example, you don't need to know what a Henkel function is to use state Orson, but just for your information. Where the Henkel function, so each h here, each h here is a Henkel function, 
and then where the Henkel function H two V is essentially a complex value function J V minus I Y V where J V and Y V are basal functions of the first and second kind respectively. And just to reiterate, this bit here is, you don't really need to know that. I think the main point that I'd like you guys to know is that Theodorson was able to solve this integral and the solution is Theodorson's function and that function is a complex value function that is only dependent on the reduced frequency k. Now, how do you actually compute something like that? You can actually use MATLAB. So, note, if you want to come up with the value of the Theodorson frequent, uh, Theodorson's function for a certain reduced frequency, here is the way to do it. In MATLAB, you can get one of those basal functions, such as, let's say you put HV, and a where v and a could be different numbers of some value z that is equal to the following command in matlab of v a and z so this is how you would calculate the theodorson function and even though Theodorson's function is kind of nasty and it depends on these weird Hankel basal functions and all that, there has been a bunch of later works by R.T. Jones and some others that have come up with approximations um, using transfer functions and time domain functions that approximate the Theodorson, the Theodorson function. And the... Uh, the neat thing about these functions is that you can use them to do lots of design work, control work. Like for example, this, this term here, you can't really do much work with because it's not in a transfer function form and it's not in the Laplace domain. So there are approximations to put this approximations where Theodorson function can be put in the Laplace domain and such. So lots of people have used approximations to approximate this when the actual analytical expression wouldn't work for their um, application. Thus, the final expression for lift is L is equal to pi rho b squared times h dot plus u alpha minus b a alpha dot plus 2 pi rho u b times h dot plus u alpha plus b half minus a alpha dot. Similarly, the expression for the pitching moment about the half chord is equal to pi rho b squared b a h dot minus u b half minus a alpha dot minus b squared of one over eight plus a squared alpha double dot plus two pi rho u b squared a plus half 
CK times H dot plus U alpha plus B half minus A alpha dot. And let me box this in like so. So just to recap what each of the terms mean, pi rho is density. Um, no, I like this one more actually. Uh, B, is, B is the half chord length. H double dot is the uh, heaving acceleration. So heaving acceleration with the with going down being positive. Angle of attack, U is the free stream velocity. A is the ratio of the distance between the origin to the pitching point. So let me just type it, write it down. A is equal to, let's say you have a wing, you have the origin here. Let's say you're pitching about this point. If this is X, a is x over b. Um, let's see, yeah. And then what else needs explaining? I think, and then dot is rate, uh, velocity rates or pitching rates or whatever. And then double dot says acceleration. And then alpha is just the angle of attack. So one thing that I want to really note here is that this, again, if you remember, this is the non-circulatory contribution of the force. And I forgot to put CK here. So this is CK. Anyway, this right here. Without CK is actually the quasi steady lift. So this is the quasi steady lift you get from thin air flow theory. So um, yeah, as I said, this is the lift you get from quasi steady thin air flow theory. And then we're multiplying this component of lift with CK. And then this is the pitching moment about the mid-court. So we can normalize the lift and the pitching moment to get CL. and C, M of C over two. And then if you wanna get the pitching moment about the leading edge, you can do the following. Plus C, M, C over four, which is equal to minus C, L over two, plus C, M and C over two. Anyway, let's just go back to Theodorson's functions. So as we mentioned, Theodorson's function C over C of K is a complex valued function that is dependent on the reduced frequency of the oscillation of the wing. So it's F of K plus I G of K. This function accounts for the effects of the shed wake on the circulatory lift component. And we know that the non-circulatory term from d phi dt, which we computed in the non-circulatory force lecture, accounts 
for pressure forces required to accelerate fluid in vicinity of airfoil. And this is essentially the added mass force. All right, so, I mean, it should be obvious from this expression that if you want to obtain f of k, you just find the real component of c of k. And if you want to obtain g of k, you just find the imaginary component of c of k. So let's, to, let's take a closer look at the relation of Theodorsen's lift equation to quasi-steady thin airfoil theory, which you, you guys have talked to, about um, in the previous section of the module. So lift equation relation to quasi-steady thin airfoil theory. So all what Theodorsen adds here is that, so you have the quasi-steady lift, okay? Theodorsen's, Theodorsen comes up with a function that is based on the reduced frequency that essentially acts to modify this quasi-steady lift to make it more physical. And then he comes in and also finds the non-circulatory force contribution, which is not found in quasi-steady thin airfoil theory. So we can actually come up with sort of a schematic or a schematic open loop block diagram to describe what's happening here. And uh, let me do it here. So what is happening? You have two parallel branches in this block diagram. The first branch is related to the non-circulatory force, and this is the circulatory force branch. Now for the circulatory non-circulatory force plan, branch, you have a bunch of kinematic inputs, H double dot, alpha double dot, and alpha dot. You pass it through the non-circulatory force expression here to get the non-circulatory force contribution. On the other branch, you have h dot, alpha, and alpha dot, and you pass it through the quasi-steady branch or the quasi-steady expression, this one, to obtain LQS, okay? And then you pass it through another block, which is the reduced, uh, which is the Theodorsen function based on the reduced frequency to finally get LC. Now, you add those two together to get the total lift. In this context, in sort of a signals processing or signal systems context, CK does two things. CK attenuates and delays the quasi-steady lift signal, which means that you have a quasi-steady signal coming in that is a function of time. It could be like oscillating or whatever. What CK does is that if you have this quasi-steady signal coming into CK, CK attenuates it and delays it. So it modifies the signal as such. Now, the attenuation and the delay captures the effect of the wake on the circulatory force of the wing. And in a sense, it adds some inertia 
to the system. So in quasi-steady, thin air flow theory, you, you input some kinematics and you immediately get out lift. This is not how the real world works. In the real world, you put in your kinematics, okay, you start moving the wing, and there is a bit of delay between putting in those kinematic motions and experiencing the lift. Because in reality, there is nothing that is, you know, instantaneous. Okay, you can't just get instantaneous from the circulatory portion. There is always a delay between putting in your kinematics and getting your lift. Whereas in the non-circulatory contribution of force, there is no lag between kinematics and lift. And that's because this is an added mass force. And the added mass force relies on, as you remember, accelerating fluid in the vicinity of the airfoil away from it as you're moving. Now, since the fluid itself is incompressible, once the wing starts moving, it instantaneously, in theory, has to move the fluid out of its way so that we maintain the incompressibility of the fluid. Circulatory force does not work like that. Circulatory force is dependent on the buildup of lift, the buildup of lift and the wake. And that the physics of of um, the circulatory contribution of the force requires a delay between the kinematic inputs and experiencing the lift. Now, it doesn't only delay the force, it also attenuates it, which means that essentially in quasi-steady thin air flow theory, once you start moving, I'm sorry about that, once you start moving, you're going to build up some bound vorticity, right, which causes lift. Now, let's say you also account for the wake that is shut from the wing. This wake is counter-rotating and thus induces a downwash on the wing. This downwash attenuates the lift force that you get from quasi-steady thin air flow theory. Anyway, this is this sort of block diagram schematic is a is a sort of an alternative way of looking at Theodorson that may be helpful to some of you. All right, moving on. Well, given some oscillating input with some reduced frequency k you can obtain the amplitude of ck ck absolute is equal to f squared plus g squared square root which is just pythagoras and then the face of ck call it phi here, is equal to the inverse tangent of g over f, which remember, c is equal to f plus ig. All right, so as we said, Theodorson function ck Act to introduce an amplitude reduction. And a phase lag to the quasi-steady or QS lift response that you obtain from quasi-steady thin air flow theory. And as we mentioned, ignoring the non-circulatory contribution and CK, you get quasi-steady thin air foil theory.
now the plots here, I've plotted some, um, I plotted the response of um, CK amplitude and phase lag based on different reduced frequencies so that we can visualize how the Dorsen's function affects lift. So first off, here we plot given C is equal to F plus IK, sorry, not IK, IG. Here we plot the real component, which is F on the x-axis and the imaginary component, which is G on the y-axis. So as you start from um, K equal to zero, right? There is no actual reduced frequency. You essentially would have no lift and thus CK ends up being one because it's really not attenuating anything. And then as you move, as you increase K, the reduced um, frequency moves across on this sort of half circle down and up to 0 0.5. So as you sort of plot the C vector, its magnitude is absolute value of c and the phase lag is the let is the angle that c makes with the x-axis and as we increase k we can plot each of these individually on a different plot as a reminder c the absolute value of c or the magnitude of c represents the amplitude reduction that is experienced by the quasi-steady lift and the angle phi introduces a lag between the signal coming in, quasi-steady signal, and the actual lift signal experienced by the wing. So as you see here, plotting C, the amplitude of C as a function of K, as you start with no reduced frequency, that amplitude is one. There is no attenuation, no reduction, nothing. But as you increase the reduced frequency, the attenuation increases. So you the amplitude in the, the amplitude of CK decreases, which indicates that you're attenuating the signal more as K increases, and that it asymptotes at some point close to 0 0.5 or at 0 0.5 it asymptotes which means that for really high reduced frequency pitching or oscillation or heaving, you end up with half the quasi-steady lift response being attenuated because of the unsteadiness of the wake. Now for the phase lag, we see that again at zero, K, there is no oscillation, no lag, but as you sort of increase K, the lag in the response increases up until 15. So it peaks at minus 15, and then it goes back to no lag. But then keep in mind, as you approach no lag in the system, increasing K, your lift response is severely diminished because of, compared to quasi-steady lift because of the high frequency. Anyway, um, yeah, this is it for Theodorsen. And uh, honestly, this derivation has been long and tenuous and I don't expect you guys to know or memorize every little detail about the derivation. I expect you guys to know all the Theodorsen results, you know, starting from like starting from probably starting from here downwards, you guys should know that essentially very, very well because it's it's Theodorsen's function is or Theodorsen's model is really helpful, really important. But in terms of the derivation, I think the point that you guys should come with here is 
understanding the different mechanics that are involved in potential flow modeling, understanding the different tricks of the trade in modeling different aerodynamic, aerodynamic sort of situations, understanding the assumptions that go into the model. This is really important. So understanding when and when not you can apply that model and that relies on you understanding the derivation and the assumptions that went into deriving the model. Um, also, conformal mapping is something else that's really important and I hope you guys come out of this lecture with a better understanding and more fundamental understanding of how conformal mapping would work in unsteady aerodynamic modeling. And um, I mean, that's pretty much it. Don't, don't memorize the derivation. Try to go through it and understand it bit by bit um, and understand the assumptions that went into the different aspects into it. Understand the different, understand the, the, the reasons we, can, we use bound vortex sheets in some places and we use sources and sinks in some other places and understand the mechanics of this modeling and you guys will, will come out pretty strong from this. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks for listening and watching this video. And if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, asking Dr. Jones or asking me about them. We're here to help.